Welcome all. My name is Seth Green, and on a afternoon like this one, I'm especially grateful to say that I'm the dean here at the Graham School at the University of Chicago. And we are thrilled to be having a conversation with Dr. Ezra Tazdalen about her upcoming course, Nights of Play, which will explore a novel and the broader work of, um, of, of Omar Pahak. Uh, we at the Graham School are very proud to be the home of lifelong learning at the University of Chicago. And we are actually one of three founding divisions of this university, because when William Rennie Harper, uh, pictured on the right of your screen, and John D. Rockefeller on the left, were imagining the University of Chicago, they wanted to make sure that the big ideas of this university reached all learners at all ages and stages of life, or as they said, revolutionized university study in this country. And so they created the first extension in US higher education aimed at bringing these liberal arts to lifelong learners. And 130 years later, we remain trailblazers in lifelong learning that aims to explore the big ideas that challenge and change the world through programs and classes in the <laughs> arts, sciences, and society. And this afternoon, you're gonna hear a conversation with Dr. Ezra Tazdalen, who is teaching a course this upcoming spring uh, on this book. And we are very excited. Now I'm gonna uh, take down my screen and uh, we can see Ezra. Uh, and to begin our conversation, let me just offer a little bit of a biographical introduction. Uh, Ezra is a native of Istanbul, Turkey. She received her BA in Social and Political Sciences at Sabanchi University and her MA degree in Middle Eastern Studies in 2005 and her PhD degree in Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations in 2014, both at the University of Chicago. Her teaching focuses on the history, languages, literatures, and cinema of the Middle East and North Africa, as well as translation theory. And so, let me start, Ezra, with a question about why this book. Um, it is by a very well-known author in Turkey and around the world, Orhan Pamuk. Uh, so why did you choose this book to anchor your class this upcoming spring? And who is the author? And how does this latest book fit into his broader work? Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. And thank you for being here on this afternoon um, from all over the world, really. <laughs> um, I'm happy that you're here. Uh, so uh, I, um, I love historical novels. Uh, I love them so much that I wrote a dissertation <laughs> on them. Uh, and uh, I love the fact that they combine history and literature, that they are... Um, sort of this kind of gray area between reality and uh, fiction. And uh, this this novel is, is a historical novel by an author whose work I really admire. And um, I, I have read and, uh, and taught in the past as well. Orhan Pamuk is um, so far the only Turkish Nobel Prize laureate in literature. He uh, received it in, it in 2006. Um, I'm, uh, I mean, I'm sure all of you have heard about him. He's pretty well read. And certainly there are several Turkish authors whose work is not as visible as his, um, who has, have not been translated as much as his work, uh, but uh, he's one of the most visible ones in uh, overall in world literature. Um, he writes uh, postmodernist novels on um, history, identity, uh, binaries of East and West, um, modernity, religion. Um, his novels are just really a great sort of um, place to start talking about um, broader issues on uh, the Middle East uh, and North Africa, and also about Turkey specifically, the Ottoman Empire in Turkey. Um, he also wrote a memoir, which I've taught before, Istanbul, Memories and the City. His novels are um, very visual. He is actually also really interested in, in painting and uh, art. And he's, he tries to paint a picture with words, which he's, he's said this before. Um, he also wears many hats. He's not only an author, but also a curator uh, of a museum that uh, he has in Istanbul right now um, called the Museum of um, Innocence. Um, uh, and then, uh, he's um, 
he uh, also is a photographer and and painter. So he's also um, a somewhat controversial figure. And I love controversy. No, joking. <laughs> I don't love controversy. But uh, he's a controversial figure um, among Turks and internationally as well. Um, so uh, this book specifically, The Knights of Plague, is his most recent work that has been translated uh, into English just this past year. And um, the reason that I'm devoting a whole class to it is because it's a quite long uh, novel. And uh, I believe that it's also a great place to sort of enter his his work if you haven't read him before, or even like expand your knowledge of his work that is really relevant to where we are right now. And I'll talk more about that later, but um, but uh, it's kind of has a lot of parallels, despite being a historical novel, has a lot of parallels to our current reality. So um, so that's how I can kind of encapsulate that. <clears throat> Well, so you mentioned that this is a historical novel and a kind of Mary's fact in fiction. And I thought it might be useful first to come back to the time and place that this book is set. And then for you as a historian to give us the real facts. So talk about this, you know, book is set in the Ottoman Empire in 1900. What is happening in this period in reality? And we'll lay that groundwork and then we'll come to the book and how it alters that reality. Sure, sure. So um, this is a really interesting time uh, in the Middle East overall and North Africa. Um, this is a time when the sort of multi-ethnic, multinational, multi multi-religious empires such as the Ottoman Empire and the Austro-Hungarian Empire in general are kind of coming to an end. Um, it's the rise of nationalism, um, the sort of like the the death uh, uh, of these empires is imminent. Um, the rise of the nation state is imminent. Several Balkan states have sort of um, uh, have been independent already. Uh, so uh, during during this time, of, of course, the Ottoman Empire is also desperately trying to sort of save itself by reforms through um, some measures of. Um, I mean, they seem like desperate measures in, in retrospect, but at that time they were quite uh, serious uh, about them. So lots, lots of reforms happening, but unfortunately they're unable to um, sort of amount to much. Uh, there's also, this is also during the reign of Abdul Hamid II, who Orhan Pamuk also refers to in, um, in the book. Uh, he, he, he was um, 1876, uh, between 1876 and 1909 was his, uh, he, he was the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire and that time uh, was uh, also a really interesting, he's also a controversial figure who people um, criticize a lot, some people adore him, some people criticize him, uh, but he really uh, was called a despotic or an autocratic Sultan, so um, he has this sort of legacy of that. And among all this, we have um, a group of uh, a group called the Young Turks, which you may have heard of before. Uh, they're sort of this oppositional group to Abdul Hamid II, and eventually in 1908, they are able to sort of bring on a revolution uh, called the Young Turk Revolution. And uh, it's just a really, really interesting time, sort of like a breaking point in uh, the Ottoman Empire's history uh, in the early 20th century, which is actually also uh, what my research has been based on. So I feel kind of like the most comfortable in this time period. It's sort of um, home to me. Um, so um, a lot of loss of territory. This is uh, the Ottoman Empire is called, you know, the sick man of Europe. You may have heard of these before, but also there's a lot, a lot of push and pull between modernity and tradition at this point. Like during these reforms, there are these debates that we will also get in in our class when we actually discuss uh, this novel and also sort of overall uh, Orhan Pamuk's work. Um, Turkey is at the crossroads between East and West. So that really is reflected in Orhan Pamuk's work as well. And I think that's one of the major um, points of attraction for like the global literature, the reader, the readership. So. Um, Wonderful. Well, so this is a momentous time in Turkey, and it's a moment of crossroads between this question of East and West and what direction do you head in, and then ultimately, you know, comes to a place of decline for the Ottoman Empire later. Um, he is picking up on aspects of that, 
but he's also inventive. And so I'm curious if you can now move into the novel and offer us a snapshot of Knights of Plague, and then we'll jump into kind of the relevance of the book and what you're reading for. Sure, sure. Um, so it's uh, a historical novel, like I've mentioned before, but it's also kind of like a detective story and a murder mystery at the same time. Um, it's called an outbreak narrative, and uh, it's set during uh, the, the third, what's called the third major uh, plague pandemic, uh, which uh, was around 1855, I think was the starting point, and then um, kind of um, was was broader after like kind of like the as we know of plagues now, and they tend to sort of uh, expand, right, to the world. So um, it's set in, I believe, 1901 was the exact year in um, what is a fictional island in the Ottoman Mediterranean. And um, it, this island is called Mingaria. Uh, and, um, and it's some people say that it's loosely based on Cyprus or Crete. Uh, very, you know, multi-ethnic, uh, multi some, some uh, Mediterranean islands that actually exist. So, um, uh, in the in the novel, there is this quarantine expert, uh, Bonkowski Pasha, who arrives at the island, and the whole narrative is sort of um, based on trying to contain the plague, um, and uh, several things might. Um, be very familiar to our audience here. <laughs> there are several lockdown measures. There is significant um, opposition to them based on which group people belong to. Uh, we, but this is a really rich novel. It it's not only about it's not only a murder mystery and not only about the plague, but it's also about nationalism and the rise of nationalism. So. Um, so uh, we we see this character of uh, Kamil Pasha, who uh, is sort of the leader in um, proclaiming a republic of Mingaria, uh, and um, uh, sort of leads this cultural revolution. So we see a lot of um, a lot of I mean, what Benedict Anderson comes to mind, of course, the nation as this imagined community, and in this novel we see sort of the unfolding of the events that bring that into reality. Um, we also see, of course, the figure, as, I, as I've mentioned before, of Abdul Hamid II, the Sultan, who is um, seen both as an autocrat and a modernizer. We also see the different dynamics between the groups on the island, uh, the Muslims and the Christians, uh, mainly, uh, but also the, the ones who are more um, scientific and, you know, the, the Western minded methods uh, of medicine and the ones who are more traditional, uh, more traditionally um, um, minded. Um, so uh, the chief chief inspector is murdered then uh, at the beginning of the novel and uh, there's a prince and um, his wife, Prince Nuribe, who um, come to the island on a ship and they're trying to um, find the culprit. So it's also kind of engrossing in that way. Um, very postmodern in uh, that we cannot really kind of put it into like one genre of um, of literature or fiction. So um, hopefully that uh, answers your yeah. question, Seth. Well, so I'm curious, um, in a moment we'll talk about how it applies to today, but if we Sure. Think about your original description of what's happening in the Ottoman Empire in the early 20th century. And then we think about the book. What does a reader learn about Ottoman society from the book? How does this give you a, a real view into the world at that time? Um, it Yeah, it, it really is. Uh, I believe in literature as a great way of sort of um, entering into and getting getting to know a culture. Um, it's a great tool for that. And this novel is no exception. Um, so we, throughout this novel, um, we can think of the island of Mingaria as sort of like this um, snapshot of Ottoman society or like um, like um, a cross section of Ottoman society in which, uh, like, I, like I've mentioned before, it's like multi-ethnic, multi-religious. There are minorities, it's not only Muslims, but Christians and Jews um, and um, who live in, in this society. It's sort of like this melting pot of cultures. And um, this, this island is, uh, again, like a, like a microcosm of, of that, uh, of a, an example of that. 
Um, we also see the different binaries that exist in the Ottoman Empire at that time, like I've mentioned before, like between this being stuck between East and West, between modernity and religion, um, conservatism, like the more conserve being more conservative versus versus uh, more um, reform minded, um, wanting to keep things as they are versus wanting to change them, you know, um, so, so we can definitely see all of that going on, uh, but also how mutual suspicions arise as well, right? So like uh, Muslims and Christians being suspicious of each other, or like uh, as with the rise of nationalism, um, different um, ethnicities or nationalities um, uh, kind of being suspicious of each other. Uh, we also, I mean, I was thinking of it and the Ottoman society in a lot of ways is also very similar to somewhere like the United States and you would be surprised because I mean so the motto of the United States is a pluribus unum right so from many one uh, so the Ottoman society is also sort of several groups of different origins coming to get together to make up a society so very similar in the way that they um, these dynamics work also really similar that um in the way that, uh, and I'll talk more about that later, that some groups respond to the lockdown measures and how they resist, right? Uh, and we can we can talk more about that when um, uh, when we talk about the parallels and how uh, we we historians see history repeating itself many many times. So um, although this is a fictional island, there are several historical realities in it right so yeah. definitely those are some of the some of the uh bullet points that come to my mind well and let's come to the parallels uh to today and um i know that the book was just translated and put out in english recently but i believe it was actually put into the world like originally written and published um just prior or, or around the, the beginning of the pandemic and so yeah, can you talk about those parallels? And it's striking when we think about how, you know, this may have been written by Orhan before the pandemic gave even further understanding to these issues. Right. And Orhan Pamuk himself was kind of uh, angry about that. He, um, he had, I think he gave an interview to the point of saying that I was doing plague before it was fashionable or something like that. So, um, so yeah, he certainly had this idea for a plague novel uh, before uh, the pandemic started. But during the pandemic, I think, I think this, so the Turkish publication date for the novel was 2021, I believe, is when I first read it in Turkish. And then, so we were well into the pandemic by then. Um, he finished it up during the pandemic, I think, is how the timeline worked. Um, and yes, certainly there are several parallels to um, what we as, a, as the world have gone through in the past three, three years now. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, like I said, um, there are several uh, similarities that uh, the readers who... Uh, take my class and read this book with me we'll see um first the first and foremost is like like i mentioned before how a lot of groups resist uh actively resist being contained right Be, being like physically contained so um there are several isolation measures that are talked about in the book uh, quarantine measures lockdown very similar to what we have gone through and um a lot of groups just do not accept that. And um, and there are several um, tensions that arise from that. And, um, and uh, also uh, another similarity that we've seen, unfortunately, in our reality as well is being suspicious of representatives um, of, um, well, being suspicious of representatives of the state, uh, someone who's coming with the state's authority. And we can sort of think about similars to, uh, so Fauci, for example, in our um, modern times, and how a lot of people are suspicious of um, measures of CDC in general. Um, very, very similar uh, in, in the novel, we have um, a lot of re like suspicion towards these the state uh, sent representative. Um, there's also a lot of hesitancy towards scientific methods of treatment and Western medicine, which 
in some ways you can kind of understand in the Ottoman Empire um, of the you know early 20th century but it's kind of hard to wrap our minds around in modern times some sometimes but yes there's that hesitancy that we still see I mean we we have in the in the United States we have anti-vaxxers we have uh anti-maskers uh so several several parallels to our our current reality um that we can kind of draw from uh in the book um Unfortunately, there's also, again, something that we've seen in the past two to three years is blaming, you know, a certain ethnicity or minority or an outsider, um, which also happens uh, in the book, and being suspicious of them and blaming them, putting the blame on them to sort of have brought on the pandemic um, or brought on the plague or the illness. So um, that's also another significant parallel. Um, unfortunately, I wish it wasn't parallel to our reality right now, but we have seen, you know, in, in our current reality, we have seen a lot of anti-Asian um, uh, hate crimes kind of being on the rise in the past three years. Um, a, lot, uh, a lot of unfortunate parallels to that as well. So uh, those are the, the main ones that I can uh, kind of think of so far. <laughs> well, so I have one more question and then we're going to come to many questions that are filling up the chat. Oh, yes, sure. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. have um, described this as historical novel. There's part fact, part fiction. You're going to read the novel in the class. But one really cool aspect when we were talking about your syllabus is you're also going to be looking at some period pieces as well. And so can you just talk about how you're going to be teaching this class? I think it's a really novel approach to marry the literature with the history. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, right. I, um, I uh, have certainly taught Pomuk's work before. So I, we will definitely uh, kind of, so we, we, what I usually do with, lit with literature is not, not, pre not presented to the reader in isolation, but uh, when I teach, especially historical novels, we try to read um, actual hist like history, secondary sources as well. So um, we, I will definitely provide the historical context as much as possible so that the readers can um, extricate, you know, really fact from fiction and also to be able to really contextualize the novel at the historical period or the, 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 the time, the moment that it stands in. Um, I mean, that's the historian part of me, uh, definitely kind of coming in and uh, trying to, because a, a lot of people really, especially in the US, don't really know that much about the Ottoman Empire and especially the late Ottoman Empire. So I will supplant the reading of the novel with readings that provide that for the reader. Um, we will also um, compare and contrast uh, parts of the novel to Pomuk's earlier work, uh, because uh, as I said, I've um, I've taught his work before, and there are also re references to plague in other books of his, such as like the White Castle, for example, which I've I've taught before. So we'll we will look at that, and. Um, Another interest of mine is translation theory, and um, we will also do a close textual analysis, and um, we will look at sort of how the novel, I mean, this is a translation, and the readers will be reading a translation unless they know Turkish, uh, but I can kind of provide the original paragraph in some cases, and sort of we can look at it together to see how uh, this concept is rendered in the target language versus the source language. So, and what happens in that process. Um, another sort of hook that I wanna insert here is that we will have a special guest lecture at one of the classes. I haven't decided which one yet, which week, but um, my dear friend, associate professor, um, uh, Dr. Nuket Varluk, uh, who is at Rutgers University right now, is a worldwide uh, renowned uh, plague scholar. Uh, she's an Ottoman historian and she will visit our class. And she was last seen in the Netflix documentary, The Rise of Empires, <laughs> about the Ottoman Empire. So she's also kind of like a celebrity as well. But um, she's also a really dear and old friend of mine. So um, we, we will have her to uh, to because she has two books published on the uh, the plague in the Ottoman Empire, so we will have her um, for our for our class to sort of give us her what she thinks of of of, of all this. So um, yeah, so those are some uh, some plans that I'm excited to share about my class. Wonderful. Well, um, we have a few questions. Uh, speaking of plagues, uh, on parallels with Tammuz, the plague, uh, which oh. as you may know 
you know, really had a resurgence during the pandemic. Many people right, right. that as a way to, you know, begin thinking about how people across time and space have thought about moments like the ones that we entered with the pandemic. I don't know if you're familiar, Ezra, mm -hmm. with Hamu's The Plague, but, you know. Yeah, any um, I've, I, uh, I haven't read it myself, but uh, I've heard of the, certainly parallels being drawn, uh, for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I, I think. To, oh yeah, go, go ahead. No, no, I think the audience has some really great points on that is what I was going to say, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, for those wanting those parallels, uh, check the chat. We have some great comments in mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm curious to go into um, this, this question of why Pamuk is controversial. Um, you mentioned a few times that, you know, especially within Turkey, there is controversy around yes. him. Um, what is the source of that controversy? Um, the source is uh, some of Pamuk's um, statements on uh, official what's called the the formal Turkish history, which is what um, so Pamuk was uh, I, th I think accused or uh, he actually was actually um, he had to go to court for uh, insulting Turkishness, which is an actual crime, unfortunately, in Turkey. Uh, but he uh, made statements to the point of saying, you know, a million, um, I think it, he said millions of um, Armenians and Kurds were killed. Um, and um, and a lot of Turks had issues with, with that statement. Uh, a lot of Turks who especially are um, uh, more, um, you know, nationalist Turk, Turks uh, had, a lot of Turks don't even read Orhan Pamuk. They really criticize him to the point that, um, they don't even approach his work. They don't pick up a book. They he's more well now known, uh, renowned internationally. But um, certainly those statements, uh, he has been accused of like being awarded the Nobel Prize of Literature uh, because of those statements because he said those, uh, which is absurd, of course. Uh, but um, I, I uh, yeah, there are several several tur Turks, like I said, like several groups of nationalist Turk Turks who um, uh, dislike uh, Pamuk's uh, political views. So therefore, they completely put aside his literary work. Um, and um, and yeah, so that's the main, like the major source of the controversy is Pamuk's statements. So mm -hmm. we've got a few more questions on Pamuk just to tie these together. Um, sure. How is Pamuk being treated by the government of Turkey at this time? And also, um, what is Pamuk's attitude toward Islam? I know those are two separate ones, but they both relate to him. Uh, what's the second question again? His, His attitude, attitude toward Islam. If Islam. Any um, hmm. Those are interesting questions. So the the government, I'm not sure. I mean, he, I think he's he receives a lot of death threats, um, not surprisingly. So he has to um, he has to go around uh, with a lot of security. I think um, he also I think teaches. So he lives between Istanbul and and the U.S. I think he teaches at Columbia University every fall. He has a course that he teaches there. So um, he. Um, he will, um, so I'm not sure how uh, the Turkish government right now, um, I mean, they definitely, uh, we know that we, we know that Turkey right now as sort of like an Islamist leaning government. And um, there are several people who, like I said, like who criticize his work and several people who support him. So it depends on, I guess, different like groups in the government like we can't say of like one single attitude uh, and then the second question was about his his approach towards islam yeah. i think um he, he uh comes from a secular background uh like an upper middle class background in uh he broke he grew up in istanbul in a relatively wealthy family and uh he despite having not having um you know a typical religious like background he does he's very well read in islamic history and you can kind of see this in his novels as well for example in a novel like my name is red um which is another historical novel set in, in earlier of the ottoman empire like 16th century um you can see that he um he has several references to uh, islamic art uh, architecture um miniature painting. Um, he also wrote a, a book about political Islam called Kar Snow, uh, which is set in Eastern Turkey. So um, he doesn't, 
align himself with Islamic views, but he does have a command of Islamic history in general, I think. So as far as I can kind of summarize my answer to that question. So we have a question here about historical realist fiction, uh, which you know you described earlier as a gray area. Mm -hmm. uh, in your view, how are magic realistic takes on history a different kind of gray area? Are they mm -hmm. more or less ambiguous than fictional works like Pamuk's that perhaps stick closer to the bounds of reality? If I wanted to read up on theories of historical realism and its in-betweenness, any recommendations for starting places? So we have someone that is very interested in this area that you know well. Right, right. That's that's a really great question. And um, and I have given this example before, but so yeah, it's the especially the magical realist historical novels are even blurring the boundaries even more. And uh, we are de deliberately kind of confused, like the, the author deliberately confuses as to what was real and what what's not. But um I always give the example of the uh, something like the Underground Railroad by Colson Whitehead, which is um, again a, a historical novel, but has a lot of magical realist elements in it. Um, it in which there's an actual underground railroad, like in the novel. I mean, not, not that, so that didn't exist in history. So the the reader who is not well versed in American history um, might kind of be duped or <laughs> might be kind of uh, confused about. Um, into thinking that there was an actual railroad like that. So it's a little bit, it's it's difficult if you do not have sort of like a guide to um, to know what really happened. It's it can be a little bit um, unsettling, I guess, is, is the word that I'm 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 looking for. But I think um, in my class, the way that we will read this novel with with historical sources um, will be a great way to to um, to approach it and sort of like to situate what was real and what was not. And in Orhan Pamuk's case, it's the macro history that's kind of like more real, but the micro history, like the actual characters the, the are fictional and, and we have to sort of just separate them, untangle them. Um, uh, I guess one, one more thing that I wanna say about that is that Pamuk is very much aspiring to be Tolstoy, Tolstoy like kind of in his narrative in this in this book he actually has um, an epigram from Tolstoy at the beginning in which he says this is both a historical novel and a history written in the form of a novel so uh, from war and peace uh, so it's it's um I mean I'm a Tolstoy apologist I love Tolstoy's work so I will always um admire whenever his name is mentioned but um it's as he zooms in and out of you know this macro and micro histories, it can be a little bit difficult to to tell which is real and which is uh, not, which is fact and fiction. But um, like I said, the the way that I have chosen to teach this class will hopefully help overcome that. On the historical novel, to this person, I can also say that um, George Lucas, the historical novel, is a great sort of seminal work of theory of on on the historical novel. Um, if they are interested, so. Wonderful. Sorry, this is my dissertation topic, so I can <laughs> talk about it for like a whole day. So um, well, we I are grateful share. for that expertise and uh, <laughs> exciting to think about how that can be brought into the class as you read a historical novel. Mm -hmm. um, Peter Makins uh, says, I wondered about the tone of Pamuk's novel. There's a lot of dark humor throughout, including some rather sarcastic remarks about all kinds of aspects of the effort to control the pandemic, dousing people in Lysol, mouse traps all over. <laughs> um, what's your perspective on Pamuk's use of humor in this and other novels? Um, I think he uses in a it's in a way he doesn't always use it. Not all of his novels are humorous. Some of some are really really serious. Um, like his earlier works, I think is more um, are uh, the Black Book, the New Life, um, Jevdet Bey and his sons. His his earlier work is definitely takes itself more seriously because I think he was also trying to establish himself as a sort of a novelist as um, and also coming to terms with a lot of Turkish history and uh, but I think in this um, these later novels he's having more fun as a novelist as well and um, he is uh, more confident 
and he knows that he will be read <laughs> that um, that the things that he writes at, by this point uh, are going to be read by people who who like his work so I think he's taking more of a liberty to uh, be um, sort of the devil's advocate in some places if that makes sense um, and kind of trying to make us see both points of of a controversial issue for example so I think that's how he deliberately uses humor more in his later novels and he's getting older and as we get older you know we care less about what other people think and I think that's kind of reflected in his um in his work as well so uh which is great I think and Another I, question here relates to um, the figures, in particular, the narrator figures in the novel. The actual narrator is a woman, and so is Princess Paxes, right. from whose letters the events are projected. Um, right. uh, curious if you have comments on why women, um, sure. this person mentions that's a new strategy for the author. Yes, so um Yes, well, in the previous novels, uh, we don't see a lot of, I mean, we, the, the main, the protagonists have always been, um, I mean, most of them male, and they've been kind of male dominated. But this novel is very, like I said, uh, postmodern in the way that it tells us about, uh, so it's told us from the mouth of Mina Mingar, who is um, uh, hearing the story from the kind of like extricating it from the letters of Pakize, Princess Pakize. Um, and um, it's sort of like a roundabout way of telling the story, which Orhan Pamuk has used before in, um, for example, in the beginning of the White Castle, he uses this very similar strategy of um, having found sort of like a manuscript in an archive and uh, kind of going that the, the fictional character that he creates has found this manuscript and that's what the novel is so we we see these postmodern you know methods and techniques a lot before but um that's a really interesting question so the female narrator um frames the story and then we are told the story right so um i don't necessarily know why Pomuk chose to do it this way maybe he was responding to criticisms of his previous work being very um male dominated um i maybe he was trying to balance it out by uh, having having a female narrator but he certainly used this method of storytelling before which we also see i mean in a lot of I mean, we we see in eastern tales uh, eastern methods of storytelling the boxed narrative right like stories within stories within stories which we see in stories as ancient as the thousand and one nights for example so um so this is kind of like a story within a story within a story, which is a great way of playfulness on the author's part, I think. Like, it, it really makes it more interesting uh, on the reader's side, so. Marna Williams asked, do you think the translation is on the whole accurate to the message of the book and representative of his style, poetic connotation, etc.? In what uh, way were there gaps, if any, between the translation into English and the original text? Right. And for most of the res reply or response to that question, um, you will have to take my class. <laughs> but uh, but uh, I will I can say that um, Ekin Oklop has translated or Pomuk before and works with the author, I think, closely. So uh, we can definitely kind of uh, count on. Um, I always want to give the translator the credit because translation is a hugely difficult enterprise. Uh, given Orhan Pamuk's sentence structures and his the length of his sentences that are sometimes as long as a paragraph, um, I really take my hat off to the translator to e for even attempting this project. Uh, so um, I think um, the translator did the best they could, but we definitely know that um, it's the translations are never. Um, the same as, of course, the the original text. And but we like during the course, we will actually look at instances where there might be something might be lost in the process. You know, as I, I kind of hate to say this because a lot of it is gained as well. I believe in translation. Um, and uh, yeah, so we'll we'll look at the text closely and look at what what I call some untranslatable concepts and how they're kind of brought over over from Turkish to English. Um, and we'll, we'll, me and my students will kind of discuss that in our class, so. Uh, Mark Pasawark uh, mentions that books, including history and novels, where characters lack last names or have too many nicknames, the Tolstoy, I find very difficult. Will I struggle with this book? And let me just broaden that question, Dr. Tesselin, 
Um, how hard is this book to read? Uh, for people that are out there that are thinking, sounds really interesting, would love to be in class with you. Um, you know, how uh, dense is the novel? What's the reading experience of the novel like? It's pretty dense, I must say. <laughs> so um, it um, it's like I said, it, I mean, when when you think about the Tolstoy comp comparison, that'll give you kind of an idea about, you know, the, the levels of description involved. And um, again, like this is a novel that moves between macro and micro history. It's not necessarily, you know, uh, in some places, it's not necessarily a page turner, but uh, that's why I we are going to read it in about seven weeks. So uh, we have, it's it's a long novel, but we are going to take our time in moving through it. And um, and um, we will have a lot of time, it's about, I think like a hundred pages per, um, per week, which is I think very doable by University of Chicago standards. <laughs> um, but, um, it's it's definitely in in the there are several very detailed de descriptions and depictions of the island, for example, but it's also really great world building. So uh, that Orhan Pamuk does in this novel, which I really kind of enjoy myself. I mean, I really like long novels, so I'm not the <laughs> right person to ask um, mm -hmm. about this. I I will always defend them. So. <clears throat> so I know we're coming to time. Um, let me ask, because uh, you talk about how there are parallels to today, you can shape your view. Um, how has reading this novel shaped your worldview in some way? Hmm. Yeah, that's uh, an interesting question. And all novels shape on us in really significant ways, unless they're, they don't really talk to us or speak to us, I guess. But um, for me, uh, as I was reading the novel, um, I was completely kind of immersed in its world. And um, it really changed, I mean, all novels change us, I believe, but it really changed me in the way that I uh, had not thought of before because I was, we were in the middle of the pandemic. It was 2021, we were still isolating and masking and um, reading a plague narrative that is, set in a geography or a region of the world that I know quite well um, was um, uh, was was really formative in my opinion. I mean, with, I, I saw the parallels between the, the history, like I, I like I mentioned before. So it, it really was. Uh, and also Orhan Pamuk, I mean, I've read all of his books. So um, and I really wanted to uh, I read this book as soon as it came out in Turkish. It was sort of I mean, when when you think about authors that you really love, their new book being published is sort of like a major event in your life. So for me, it was like that. Um, and we were, yeah, I think it was Memorial Day weekend and we had gone to Michigan to a summer house and I was I was in this book book's world for about three days. So it was, um, yeah, so uh, I that was really formative and I, I really enjoyed it. <clears throat> Well, you have been a wonderful guide for us to get started in the novel and understanding it's both understanding of the Ottoman Empire and also its deep and relevant applications to today. Um, for those who are interested, you'll hear more about her course over email, uh, and it's a way to go much deeper and into a much more dialogue on this topic. Mm -hmm. um, thank you all so much for being with us today. and. Ezra, thank you for teaching at Graham and bringing these ideas to our lifelong learners. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. And it's always a pleasure. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Have a great day.